Where am I? Okay. Sorry about that. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, so on our agenda today, we have a discussion of what to monitor at minimum and what services Arrowhive makes available for the purposes of monitoring and monitoring available within Hive Manager. Then we'll go beyond the Hive. In other words, how Arrowhive equipment can be monitored via SNMP using Cacti, which is open source. And in our discussion of cacti, we'll talk about how to get cacti, how to set up monitoring in cacti, and how to do thresholding of statistics using cacti. So first, what to monitor? Well, at the very least, you'd want to know if the access points were up or down. If they're down, you can't do any of the other monitoring, so this would be a real problem. The number of devices connected to each access point is important, for the purposes of determining current load as well as capacity for the future. The fact that an access point might have a lot of users on it would be good to know, but if an access point had very few users connected, that might also be good to know. For example, if no one ever connects to an access point, is the radio hardware bad? Or maybe it's located in an out-of-the-way place. A large number of devices on an access point also might be okay where user expectations haven't been set that there will be coverage. <clears throat> For example, the cafeteria. Has the administration told students that they would have unlimited internet in the cafeteria if they brought their cell phones to school? Perhaps not. Another in, uh, area of interest would be the interface load, not just of the radio, but the Ethernet. And of course, the availability of addresses for the users, the DHCP scope. So beyond the basics, tracking things like interference, the percentages of traffic in different categories, perhaps broadcast, unicast, and so on, and AP Health are also options. So in terms of doing up-down monitoring, this can be done by Hive Manager but it can also be done using any SNMP manager. You may also already have an SNMP manager set up in your network, maybe something other than Cacti, and instead of looking at Hive Manager and an SNMP manager, you might want to see this on one pane of glass. Regarding monitoring the devices connected to the APs, um, I've actually been studying to recertify in wireless. And the study guide was written for, by some folks from Aerohive who cite Aerohive best practices. And they suggest that 35 to 55, 50 devices per radio will work if the users are doing web browsing, uh, which would be about 50, for 500 to uh, 1 meg of traffic per user and checking email. and But as you can see from the table, web browsing is at the very low end of the spectrum as far as internet usage. If you have high definition video streaming users, traffic utilization could be as high as 2 to 5 meg per user. And the authors go on to suggest that 80% use of airtime on an access point radio is full. So if a radio were up for 10 minutes, if the radio was servicing users for eight of those minutes, it would be considered full. They use an example where a number of iPads were connecting at 65 meg. So these would be obviously 802.11n connections. Um, in that scenario, the usable throughput would be around 30 meg. And in any kind of wireless network, when you see your little wireless icon indicator, it might say 130 meg or 65 meg, but you could get about half of what the icon says for true through throughput due to the amount of overhead. And wireless, even through 802.11n, is hub technology. One time device at a time is serviced. So if you were the only device on the network, you might get 30 meg. Otherwise, um, it's divided between the number of people. 
So these particular iPads are needing to do 2 meg a piece to do high definition video. If you have 30 meg times 80%, that would be 24 meg. So 24 meg divided by 2 meg per iPad would be 12 iPads. So you could have 12 iPads per radio doing high definition video. Or another way of looking at it is each iPad is getting 80% over 12 or 6.67% of the access point's radio utilization. And if the access point has two radios, 2 times 12 would be 24 iPads on the access point. So as you can see, there's a big difference between those 35 to 50 devices per radio and 12 devices per radio. And it's challenging to know what actually goes on in the classroom. In other words, is it a study hall where the students are actually checking email and web browsing? Or is it a situation where the teacher has all the students streaming individual high definition videos? So we talked about the number of devices per radio and how if you had an access point with two radios, ideally you could stream 12 iPads on one radio and 12 on the other for 24 iPads total. But what if the iPads decide not to cooperate? And instead of dividing themselves nicely between the two radios, they all glom onto one radio. Since roaming and deciding what access point to associate to is client dependent, this could very well happen. Suppose all the devices decide to use the 2.4 gig radio. This is an example uh, where we saw this happening at an LEA. Um, and there are 28 of 29 devices all on the same radio. And as you can see by looking at the OUIs, in other words, the first six digits of the MAC address, these are Apple devices. And it actually shows that in the uh, fifth column, the fourth column there. And this is an example of the same LEA, actually, same school, different room. And all the devices, and these were Apple again, decided they wanted to be on the 5 gig radio. Here we have 36 of 36 devices on the same radio. And we're not really picking on Apple. This is just to point to the fact that different generations of hardware, different drivers, different operating systems will exhibit different roaming behavior. This is an example of a different LEA where there were so many devices, and they happen to be iPads, in a particular hall, were on an access point in a particular hallway that students could get IP addresses but couldn't effectively use the internet. And you see at 11 o'clock in the morning, there were something like 75 devices on the 5 gig radio and maybe two on the 2.4 gig radio. So we agree that the 5 gig band is better than the 2.4 gig band, but 75 active devices on a single radio is just too many, no matter what the band. And this last listing um, shows a different hallway at the same school as the previous slide, where there are 81 devices on a radio at noon. But these were on the um, single 2.4 gig radio instead. So what happens to throughput when you have a lot of devices on a single radio? Uh, there's an interesting vendor neutral study that came out around two years ago where some folks decided to stress test access points using iPads. And you can see below where there's a reference to the study if you want to look it up. Uh, it's a full write up of the testing. And I only pulled out the one graph to show throughput versus the number of active devices connected. So we're not trying to pick on iPads or be for or against a particular access point vendor. In fact, I removed the vendor designations from over to the right. Um, uh, the arrow hive is one of the turquoise blue lines about midway down. Um, and since this is a two-year-old uh, study that they did, um, 
chances are Arrow has, has different hardware out now than the study was done with to begin with. So we're not picking on Arrowhive or any particular vendor. But we say no matter who the vendor is, with 16 to 20 iPads pumping out as much traffic as they can, uh, most of the access points had died by the time 16 to 20 iPads were connected. So there's an inverse relationship between the number of active devices and the throughput. And this screen shows something similar, though it was intended to show the difference in throughput that various mixes of 5 gig clients will result in. Our top horizontal line shows the number of devices uh, and the connection rates if there were all 802.11 5 gig devices. And there are 802.11 and 5 gig devices. The bottom is if they were 802.11a 5 gig devices. In other words, the slower 54 meg devices. And then the middle horizontal lines are various mixtures of 802.11n and your older 802.11a devices. And part of the point here is when you have a mixture of devices, the slower 54 meg devices slow down the 802.11 5 gig devices because they require a larger chunk of the transmit time. So what is an active device? Because we're talking about active devices. Obviously, the iPads used in these tests were active devices. One challenge we've encountered when looking at graphs, whether in Hive Manager or in Cacti, or polling devices, then querying a database to get out the information, is you folks sometimes have cart situations, where there's a cart of Chromebooks, iPads, laptops, whatever, and these devices may not have any actual users or traffic. So you'll see them on a graph, but they're not active. They may just be sitting there in the media center or the iPad garage. And this graph shows a garage type of situation. Unfortunately, these were taken after school let out, so they don't really show much, too much traffic anyhow. But here we see that there's about the same amount of traffic at midnight as there is at noon. It, the traffic is a fairly flat horizontal line. So this is probably a garage situation with a cart of some kind of device. These appear to be stationary devices. Whereas on this screen, we see no nighttime traffic, nobody there at midnight. We see the users arrive at 8 o'clock in the morning, maybe doing some web surfing at lunchtime where our traffic peaks and then come afternoon, everybody leaves, perhaps leaving a stationary device. Not sure. Okay, But again, it's a graph from the summer, but unlike the previous slide, we do see some peaks and valleys. So this is pretty much live traffic. So what can affect the performance that you see from access points beyond the mere number of users? Well, the number of radios. Sometimes we see where folks have bought single band radios. Not a good idea nowadays. Um, the number of antennas can also be critical. If you look at the specs on access points, they generally will show the transmit, receive, and spatial streams in this kind of format. Uh, the thing to remember here is the larger the numbers, the better. The better performance you will get out of an access point. And as we saw previously, the types of applications running on the devices is important to know. And the client supplicants, the cards control the roaming decisions. So there are a lot of things that you can't control because the supplicants, the software running on the devices, controls where the devices go and how they perform. The access points may have some limited effect on clients roaming decision via load balancing and band steering which we will briefly discuss. Pretty much all the major vendors support load balancing and band steering nowadays although their algorithms may differ. So with load balancing when you have heavily loaded APs they will try to encourage client devices to associate to less loaded APs. So in this case, 
where everyone is on the first and the third APs and no one on the middle one, the first and third APs know that the second AP is available and unloaded since the access points are talking to each other. And in order to encourage users to jump on the middle access point, the outside access points may beacon and advertise their SSIDs less frequently, or they may respond to client probes or association requests more slowly. And since the AP in the middle continues beaconing and doing probe responses and association responses at a normal rate, clients may decide to use it. So ideally, load balancing will result in an even mix of clients. But suppose there is no middle AP. Suppose the coverage is generally poor or the unloaded AP is at the other end of the hallway. Load balancing won't work if there's nothing to balance the traffic to or if all APs are equally busy. Band steering is similar to load balancing in that an access point will seek to control where clients go by sort of laying low with regard to beacons and so on, but it's from one band to another, one radio to another, instead of one access point to another. So here we see where there are a slew of users on the 2.4 gig radio, and the AP uses band steering to hopefully get users to slide over to the 5 gig radio. But what happens if the devices only have 2.4 gig radios? Well, this obviously is not going to work. Or if the device drivers really, really prefer 2.4 gig, they may just not go. Okay. Another thing to keep an eye on is the interface load. Not just the radio interfaces, but the Ethernet uplink and the aggregation link way on up. Since the link from the upstream switch to the access point is point to point, the out from the switch should be the same as the in to the access point. So it may not be necessary to SNMP pull both links, but the switch aggregate could be a problem depending on the number of access points downstream. In the iPad example, where there were two radios per AP, 12 iPads per radio, two meg high definition video coming down, you'd have 48 meg coming down from the internet to the access point. And if you had four access points on the switch, you'd have 200 meg coming downstream to that switch. So the need for gigabit ethernet becomes clear. And last, monitoring of the DHCP situation is important for several reasons. One, to be sure the DHCP server is alive. Uh, another is just the number of addresses being used in the scope. Because sometimes the amount of broadcast traffic on a segment um, may get to be unmanageable. And that increases with the number of devices in a segment. We see sites using slash 20 masks on their uh, infrastructure equipment. And if you're using that full scope, that would be 4,000 addresses on a wireless segment for DHCP. And oftentimes, not that many addresses are actively in use. But if you're not looking at your DHCP server, you may not know how many of those are active. And uh, running out of IP addresses, it can also be a problem, so monitoring the number left in the scope would be a good idea. We'll look at monitoring Microsoft Active Directory DHCP because it has MIBs you can use to monitor that. Cisco DHCP MIBs exist, so if you're using a Cisco switch for DHCP, we can also monitor that. And I'm sure HP has uh, DHCP MIBs too. Okay, so. What kind of network services does Arrowhive make available to monitor its access points? We have a list here of the types of network traffic that are configurable. To use Cacti, at the very least, 
SNMP must be configured. And we'll go into that later because Cacti would be querying the access points. And we'll see later where Hive Manager is actually collecting information every hour from the access points to do reports. So we talked about up-down monitoring. And Hive Manager does a pretty good job of that. Since it's communicating with the access points via CAPWAP, which is UDP port 12222, if Hive Manager stops hearing from an access point on that port, it figures the access point has died. And you will see messages in the logs to the effect of the CAPWAP connection with Hive Manager was lost. And to be really on top of things, Hive Manager does allow you to sound email alerts on occurrence of specific events, including CAPWAP problems. So this would be under administration, Hive Manager services, uh, where you have uh, your email settings. If you decide to send alerts to your Google domain um, accounts, the server to define is aspmx.l.google.com. And we see that here. Um, I think next week, uh, John Worf is going to be doing a webinar to talk about Google Relays and the options you have. But I found that this one worked pretty well for Hive Manager. Um, I like this one because it does not require authentication prior to forwarding messages. Now, if you have a Cloud Hive Manager online, this just works. But if you have On-Site Hive Manager, you'll need to be sure that TCP port 25 is open on the firewall for the Hive Manager traffic to be able to get to Google. And you might also use the Gmail forwarding feature for Hive Manager alerts, especially if you've got a large site with different technicians at each school. Here you can see where the email is coming to my um, Google account initially, but I've got uh, it set up so that depending on where the access point is, it will either go to the middle school technician or the elementary school technician. Okay, You might want to set up an alias just called monitoring at lea.org, that kind of thing. Okay, so that was up down using Hive Manager. But what about looking at the AP load using Hive Manager? Yep, you can do that. Um, you can go in and look at your access points. And the, the access points I have are at my house, so that's why we're looking at second floor office here. Um, and it does show for the last eight hours the client count, which is, I don't have many clients there. Uh, and you can go into each one of your APs and be looking at your load on a, an eight-hour basis. Or you can go into reports, client devices, Wi-Fi devices, and you can look at a unique client count on the first access point, and then the second access point, and then the third access point. And even if you email your these reports to yourself, to me it was kind of tedious to look at this information. And Hive Manager does allow you to look at a traffic breakdown, at least on the radio interfaces. You can see the Wi-Fi 1 and the Wi-Fi 0, but not so much on the Ethernet interface. So we're going to look at doing that using Cacti. And the last thing I will mention on, oh, actually, okay, Hive Manager does allow you to also look at percent utilization. We talked about the amount of time being used for servicing clients, that 80%, and I believe this is what they're referring to. These are the graphs that they're wanting to look at. And as you can see, I have pretty much zero or um, rounding down to zero on my access points. But yours probably show something more than this. Okay. Um, the last thing I will manage, mention on Hive Manager capabilities is that the AeroHive access points can be configured to send syslogs on UDP 514 to a syslog server. This may not be something you'd want to do, but if you're big on syslog, this could be useful. And we're going to be having a webinar on syslog 
maybe if you already have syslog set up and you're big into syslog and alerting on syslog and uh, have this whole syslog infrastructure set up, uh, you can use Hive Manager to configure the access points to um, receive syslog or to send syslog to your syslog server, okay, using these two screens. Okay, um, so if we um, if we're going to monitor Arrowhive using Cacti, what do we need? Well, obviously Cacti. And Cacti is a Linux-based open source software. Um, you can install Cacti yourself. We can provide instructions. Or if you get us a PC, we can install and configure Cacti to begin with. And Bradley Stevens and our team will be doing a webinar on August 12th about a Cacti virtual image, if you'd like to try that. So as you can see, Cacti doesn't require a lot of resources. And being open source, um, performance testing isn't typically done on Cacti, but these slides show you some ideas of the resources that a few Cacti users employ to manage their network devices. So above we see the devices in their network, and then below we're seeing the kind of server they're using to do the monitoring. Um, at least compared to Microsoft monitoring, this is pretty minimal to do one gig or two gig of RAM. Okay? All right, and since we would be using Cacti, or SNMP in Cacti, to monitor the Aerohive equipment, we will be using MIBS. And you don't know, have to know a lot about MIBS, but the MIBS are available to view in the Hive Manager UI, with the most interesting MIB being the AH Interface MIB that I have circled here. Um, it's really the only interesting Aerohive MIB. Uh, the, they just don't have a lot of MIB support in the product, although we understand they will be adding more MIB support in the near future. So if you're thinking you want to monitor, say, AeroHive temperature by SNMP with Cacti or any other NMS product, the AeroHive MIB would need to include a variable for temperature to be able to query it. And it doesn't have a temperature um, variable in the MIB. But that was just an illustration. Okay, so we're going to assume that you have an installed cacti. Um, I do. I have two of them, in fact. We'll see them later. Um, we do need to go through Hive Manager to tell the Arrowhive APs that cacti will be polling them. And doing this in Hive Manager is actually somewhat more involved than setting up cacti. But we'll see what's involved in Hive Manager on these next five screens, with the first being this one, where in advanced common IP addresses, host names, we have to define our Cacti servers. We actually have two Cacti servers, one's at 10.1.1.160, the second one's at 161, which I'm not showing here, but we have to define those. Then under Management Services, SNMP assignments. This is where we define our SNMP community, which is going to be um, Hive community, and our version of SNMP, which is going to be version 2. And once those two general things are set up, we have to add them to the network policy for the access points. So we tell the access points what IP addresses they can accept queries from, under Management IP Filters, and under Security Policies, we enable the different kind of services, um, such as SNMP, do we want to allow them to be pinged, and do we want to allow SSH, and there's some other services you can allow there. And when we're all done, this is our network policy, this is how it looks, and we push it down to all the access points. Okay? Um, we previously pushed this down to our access points, and we're done looking at Hive Manager, and now we're going to look at Cacti. And basically to set up Cacti, we're going to do an initial test of SNMP connectivity from our Cacti box 
to the access point. We're going to download an AeroHive template. We're going to add the list of access points to Cacti, and we only we only have two in our network, but so we're just going to go through adding one, and we're going to create graphs for the access point. Okay. So first, I'm going to test SNMP connectivity. Okay, we're going to do an SNMP walk. And we said we're using version 2C. And our community was Hive community. And our box we're querying is 10.1.1.90. And uh, we could have queried just the system part, which would be a little bit uh, abbreviated. Yeah. So it still responds, and we know our access point is in good shape there. Okay, I'm going to go and double connect. Uh, nope. Okay, so we tested our SMP connectivity. And now we're going to uh, download our template. Okay, um, I'm not going to go through the whole process of downloading something from the web because you know how to do that. Um, but if you go to this web page, you'll see where I put some AeroHive templates out there in the Cacti forum. Um, I looked for ones initially. I couldn't find any AeroHive templates. So I created uh, some templates for AeroHive. And the most recent one is called AeroHive.zip. Um, we downloaded AeroHive.zip previously to our local machine. And you can either unzip the file on your local machine, in my case a MacBook, or you can unzip it on your PC, or you can do a secure FTP from your Cacti box to get the zip file onto the Cacti box. Um, as far as a secure FTP server, the MacBook natively supports secure FTP. And I found there's a free sshd.com site utility for Windows has a, an SFTP server there, okay? Or you can be insecure and you can just do a yum install FTP on your CentOS box, taking the defaults, and that way you can just do FTP and be done with it, okay? So no matter where you've got the AeroHive zip file, you have to unzip it. And I'm really not gonna go through how to unzip a file because I think everybody knows how to unzip a file, okay? All right, so um, when the file is unzipped, it creates a number of, uh, you know, things, files that are extracted. One's called arrow each, one's called more mem, which is an expect script. Another one is called CPU, which is an expect script. The first one's the one we're really going to get into today, okay? And I'm going to move this aside and... Um, the arrow each one will get copied to your scripts directory. Your scripts directory might be a different directory than mine is, but you can see where I have my arrow each file in my scripts directory. Okay, and this is my CentOS box. And I'm going to execute it just to be sure it works. And I'm going to query that same device that we just queried, 10.1.1.90, with Hive Community. Okay? And I'm going to clear screen because it looks a little busy and just run it again. Okay. So you can see up here where it returned three variables. The first is the 2.4 gig load. I only have one user on the 2.4 gig radio, the BG meaning 2.4 gig. Second value is the 5 gig radio. I have zero users there. And I have a total of one user on the entire access point. Okay. Um, so we know our script is working, which is good. Okay. And, uh, do that. Okay. So our script is working, and now we have downloaded our AeroHive template. And we're going to go into our instance of Cacti. 
and we're going to import our template. So we have two instances of cacti. We have a production cacti and we have a non-production cacti. We're going to be doing the work on the non-production cacti and we'll be flipping back and forth so you can actually see the graphs because one of these has been doing uh, polling for a while and one hasn't. So we're going to import our Arrowhive template here. And the template is on our local machine. And let's see, we want to go to downloads. Okay, and we see the file that we unzipped, Cacti Host Template, choose, and we're going to hit the import here. And this tells Cacti what kind of an animal we're dealing with as far as doing SMP queries. And you can see when we imported it, it was successful. Everything's green up here, so that's good. Okay? And now that we have our template imported, we're going to add our device, add our access point. So we're going to go into Devices, Add, and we can call it uh, AP number 2 or whatever. Uh, and our IP address is again 10.1.1.90. And we're going to use our Arrowhive host template that we just imported. Now, we can choose to monitor the host or not monitor the host. Um, and this is for an up-down scenario. If you're using Hive Manager to monitor up-down, you may not need Cacti to do that. So in this scenario, I'm not going to choose Monitor Host, but I am going to tell it SNMP version 2, and it's going to be Hive Community for my string. Okay? And we're going to do Create. And you can see here uh, where it went out and it talked to the access point and it got really minimal information from the access point. So this is good. Hive Manager is or the Cacti is communicating with the access point. Okay? So we have created our device and now we're going to add a graph for our device. So we're going to go into Create Graphs for this host. Um, we're really not going to get into the CPU or the memory. Uh, that's It's more complex, uh, so we're not going to do that. We just don't have time. But we are going to look at graphing the Arrowhive clients. We'll hit Create. Okay? And that was successful. And now we're going to look at our other cacti, uh, which is 10.1.1.160. And we're going to look at some live graphs from where we've been doing graphing of our arrow hives for several weeks here. Okay? Uh, we have been graphing memory, CPU, and in this case, arrow hive clients. And again, my graphs are kind of boring. I mean, I've got um, one client out there right now, um, but you could see in a live network where this would be informative. You know, you could see how many you had on each radio uh, and how many you had total in cacti. Okay? Too many windows open here. All right. So we created our graphs and we went in and looked at our graphs on the other live system. And now we're going to look at monitoring our interfaces. Okay? Um, to monitor the interfaces, hit back to my, okay. To monitor interfaces on my device, here's our AP number two. We're going to use a generic data query because it's using a generic SNMP MIB2 query. It's not Arrowhive specific. So we're going to go in here and set up our query and say we want to look at SNMP interface statistics. All vendors support this. Okay, and then down at the bottom, slide this over so everybody can see, we're going to hit Add. Okay. 
and I think it's saved. Yeah, okay, add and save. All right. And now based on that graph, or, or in that adding that data query, we're going to go in and add a graph so we can look at what's going on on our interfaces. And you can see where it already went out and queried the access point to see what interfaces it had. Now some of these are not anything you would want to query, uh, but you can see where this is actually an AC access point, which I believe has two Ethernet connections, but I only have one plugged in. And I'm going to look at Wi-Fi 0 and Wi-Fi 1. Now I could look at these sub-interfaces, which are like when you have multiple SSIDs, you're going to get into the dot .1s, the dot .2s, and so on. Um, it, that would be overkill to me, okay? Uh, but in this case, I'm looking at these three interfaces, and then I'm going to choose my graph type. And you can see where there are a number of canned graphs you can choose. I'm going to do in-out bytes with total bandwidth, okay? Hit that and hit create there, okay? And this is what I meant that it, Cacti is, to me, easier than High Manager going through this. is pretty simple to set up. Okay, so we're now going to look at our live system where we've been graphing for a while. Let's see. Zero high, zero 60. No, I haven't really graphed. Okay. Well, let me see. Let me try things I can see. Graph management. Okay, hold on a second. Find, try and find my graphs here. <laughs> no, it's the other one. Okay. Zero high. No way. Okay, well, that's weird. Okay. Okay, got a problem with my graphs. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm going to check on ha what happened to my arrow hive graphs, but um, basically a graph's a graph. Uh, I did the same thing for my uplink 3750, okay? Um, one of my access points is on gigabit Ethernet is 1013. The other one is on gigabit Ethernet 1023. Then my uplink to the firewall from that 3750 switch uh, is on gig E102. Okay, so you can see where I don't have a lot of traffic through the switch, period. Uh, but what's kind of interesting, we were talking about um, Hive Manager and how it queries uh, on an hourly basis. And you can see here where there's something going on every hour on the hour where the, there's a bunch of traffic is hitting uh, the switch and going out the port. Okay, and that would be the Hive Manager traffic because I have so little traffic in my network, but you can see where the Hive Manager is going in and querying both access points on an hourly basis. Okay. Okay, so that was monitoring the uplink, the graphs. Um, okay. Uh, and they're 3750 graphs. Okay. Um, last thing we're going to talk about is installing and configuring SNMP to monitor DHCP on Active Directory. Okay. We're going to kind of whiz through this just looking at the screens. Um, it was very easy to install. The SNMP feature in 2008 R2 Server is one of those pieces of software that just kind of lurks out there. And then when you go into Server Manager and say Install Features, um, you just go in and it, it installs, and then you have to configure it to say these devices are allowed to talk to it, this is the community, and this is the version of SNMP. Okay, very simple to set up though. And uh, there are a number of different graphs that you can use to graph Microsoft DHCP. Uh, if you go out to this website, you can download one of your choice. There are graph templates, there are host templates, there are data templates. So you choose one that you want. Um, then again, in your host setup, you tell it the Active Directory IP address, uh, your community string, 
your version of SNMP, and you can see where it went out and talked to my Active Directory box. And then when you say create graphs for the host, it wants to know what scope. And I only have one scope in my Active Directory box that's active, that was doing anything. So that's why I chose that one here. And then hit Create. And then at the end, you can see where we have the graphs. And I, like I say, I experimented with different graphs. I kind of like the second one better. You can go ahead and change colors and all that if you want on these graphs using a different graph template if you wanted. So you can see I only have 10 device or 10 IP addresses in the scope of which um, I'm only using one. And we can look at that live if you'd like. Uh, but that is the uh, deal for graphing uh, DHCP. Okay. Um, very last thing we're going to talk about is creating thresholds. Because um, when you do a graph, you're probably not going to want to sit there looking at the graph all day, every day, especially if you've got hundreds of access points. But you might want to be alerted when there was some special condition going on, like if you were running out of IP addresses in the DHCP scope, or uh, the scope had gotten to a certain point, or if you had 100 users on an access point. That might be of interest to you. Okay, So these are basically some screenshots of how to go in and create a threshold. Once you've put the graph on a tree, you go in and hit the Create Threshold button. And it says, what do you want a threshold? And in this case, I said, I just want the total number of clients on an access point. And in here, you can then say, do you, how often do you want to be alerted if you have a problem? And what is your warning? In other words, if I have 55 users on my access point, uh, I want to be warned about it. If I've got 60 users on my access point, I think I've got some kind of home invasion going on because that's never going to happen. Okay, um, you can decide also if you want to receive email on that kind of condition. Okay, and if one of these thresholds were breached, these would appear under the threshold tab, and um, we can install threshold. Uh, it's a very easy thing to install in your cacti if you want thresholding set. And we're building a cacti for us, for you. Let us know. We can put thresholding on the cacti. Um, obviously, my thresholds have not been breached, but if they had been, you would see them down below. Okay. Um, we also saw where you can arrange the access points on a tree in your network. Uh, let's see, in the console are graphs here. Uh, you see where I've been doing a bunch of testing. We've got Active Directory, Tree, Arrowhive, and so on. You can get pretty deep with the tree here. So if you decided to have, um, you know, the elementary school, the middle school, the high school, you could have a bunch of branches within the tree uh, in your Arrowhive tree. So uh, the very last, in addition to what all we've talked about, we haven't discussed using SendMail from Cacti to get alerts to actually leave the Cacti box. Um, we're going to look at having another webinar on doing that. Um, we may also do another webinar about collecting load information on the various different vendor access points and saving that to a database and then querying that out. And I didn't really even have time to scratch the surface on expect scripts, which would be used to query SMP and memory. Okay, and uh, Gans is telling me we're really close to our hour here. And uh, um, so I guess we will go ahead and take uh, questions if we have questions on chat. No questions. Oh, okay, quite a question. <laughs> well, it was more of a comment than a question. It was a great job, Diana. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Um, well, we thank everyone for attending. Uh, we will be getting the webinar up online. I'll put the website up here. And uh, like I say, we're going to have a, a webinar more about cacti in a few weeks. Bradley's going to be doing that one. Um, if anybody would like to get any of this set up, please let me know. Uh, I can be reached by email if you come up with anything later.
that'd be fine. And also, if there are any other questions, you know, um, you could always direct me to Bruce as well. Um, so you can use the panel. Well, if there aren't any other questions, um, we'll go ahead and wrap this up. And as Diane said, we'll try to get this out there on the web as soon as possible. Um, if not today, but as early as tomorrow. Um, and we appreciate you guys uh, tuning in. And look forward to more webinars as the summer goes on.